Africa, the continent with the greatest biodiversity on Earth. Beckoning for centuries to travelers and adventurers, she lures us in with her scenery, her wildlife, and her beauty. But alas, these are modern times, our beautiful continent no longer balanced. Fast-growing human populations and ever-expanding cities threaten to swallow these beautiful scenes. Hungry mouths threaten to consume her resources, and human greed threatens to push some species to the very brink of extinction. But there is hope. We have our conservationists, the protectors of our wildlife and our wild places. In modern times, the greatest conservationists of all are those who give wildlife value. Many of the well-meaning lovers of wildlife and conservationists are unwittingly voting against the balance and well-being of the wildlife they love so much. Indeed, if left unchecked, unmanaged and unprotected, it will be the tribal people of Africa who decide the fate of the wildlife, all of which will be used to fill stomachs and pockets until there is none left. This is a short journey, a final cry, a conservationist's cry. Kumsena, <laughs> Tasha <laughs> Twenty-one years ago, we released 17 lion into this 850,000 acre conservancy. Today we have over 500 lion. The lion hunting has generated over a million dollars of revenue. Um, and that's what it takes to run a park like this, which is surrounded by a 450 kilometre fence with over 400 employees. It's a perfect example of how they have managed to sustain a wildlife area and have knock-on benefits for the community around it. 
We have 28 collared line here and I've had predatory researchers based here doing research over the last almost decade. It looks like there's a bleak future for the research because we will no longer be able to afford to continue this research and maintain those collars if we're not getting the revenue from the hunting. This is the king of the beasts and it's one of the few properties in Africa where their population is still expanding. Free ranging population that is very important to the future of lion and their footprint in Africa and it's in jeopardy at the moment. No good and no garagamo, a tutorism by Yoga Madera Rukumo. Whatever could ye, never do it. Now would do a ragged mussum garang, Tangaragana nae drew. A rag with a ralo garag, one ganabe in Rogar, and now have you with no other ranga rogues in the Cagoro Hira Rada no longi. No good and low, Homeda Nalin, Ogoldo. I even made it a ram Rangazaha. Wouldn't yellow then? Bila nani yangu naro gunosero, nadi iru langa zaha tokol, anare di lage, nara iru mel meri la ral jangi tokol, nadi loi di koishi, ino koloro gine koli siruai, kuni agere ni nagera ya na lo lo nyu, na lo enkari nadi, wale nara rendo gumu le na iwa na wau na leng, leganda wani amo e au lua kolo kote baya kolo. Namibia is a wonderful country with all the wildlife and the opportunity that we have to own the land and own the wildlife. That's the wonderful part about it. You know, the hunters come in and spend a lot of money here to make it possible for us to convert from Catalan, convert it back into a wonderful wildlife ranch where we could reintroduce all the wildlife that was here before. Game doesn't destroy the land like the domestic stock. They live with the land and it's instead of overgraze it and uh, really destroy the land, the game is very sustainable. Hunting in Namibia is slowly becoming one of the biggest resources in Namibia. Through sustainable hunting and utilization of the game, it has just worked wonderful for Namibia and it's grown by the year and it's a great resource for the government, for the people, the animals, everyone is benefiting out of it. These properties in South Africa from the early 90s, people started converting old cattle farms into game ranches. In those days, they estimated that there were about 600,000 animals in South Africa. And today, they estimate that there are between 16 and 20 million animals on these reserves. It's had a tremendous increase in biodiversity. And all this has been made possible by the huge influx of hunters' dollars. A few of these animals have to die. 
to support the others. If we hope to conserve these areas and we hope to preserve the wildlife, we will have to continue hunting. There is just absolutely no other way. This is my life and livelihood. Without hunter's dollars, this would not be possible. I first set foot in the Zambezi Delta in 1995. There were only 1,200 buffalo back in those days. Today, thanks to hunters and hunters dollars, we have well over 25,000. Sable, we had only a known 44 animals in those days. Today, we're close to 4,000. I often wonder where the game would be without the backing and conservation of hunters. We believe all the animals deserve our protection, from the little Sunni all the way through to the elephants. Hunter's Dollars have allowed us to run a professional anti-poaching unit, which has helped us tremendously with the conserving of wildlife. Today, my unit has found a area that the poachers are operating in. They found a couple of whip snares, and probably one of the worst is a gin trap. Behind me are the snares that the anti-poaching unit has taken out over the last 12 months. Approximately a, a thousand heavy cable snares and two and a half thousand light Sunni snares. In addition to this, we take out about a hundred gin traps plus per year. Without the hunter's dollars, we wouldn't be able to afford the wildlife the protection it so justly deserves. It is estimated that in three years, without this protection, the wildlife would be decimated. One of the really good benefits from the hunting is a regular meat drop. Our season runs from April to the end of November. And during that time, whatever meat we don't utilize within the camps is uh, delivered to the local villages. On average, they'll probably get around about uh, 10 pounds of meat a week during uh, uh, peak season per, per household. So it's made quite a, quite a, quite a change to their lives. These regular meat drops have been really effective in curbing the poaching with our local villagers. It's been a long journey, but it's been worth it. I wonder if anybody stopped and asked the stakeholders if it was okay to hate them and to hate hunting and in fact to stop hunting. I wonder if anybody asked the Bushmen who relied on those hunters' dollars and conservation initiatives. I wonder if anybody asked the rancher who dedicated his life to re-establishing wildlife across his land, the man who has invested everything he has into wildlife. I wonder if anybody asked the concessionaire who puts a large proportion of his earnings into anti-poaching, building schools, supporting clinics, educating the local populations. Did anybody ask them if it was okay to hate hunting? Did anybody research the effects that closure of hunting would have?
Kau kau cakap apa tu? Kau kau ada kawan lagi ni? Kau 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 sih kau 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 ada kama? Kau ada kau kau itu? Nah, kas kas kau ana? Aku tak. With the closure of hunting across Africa, so will stop the dollars flowing into wildlife economies brought by visiting hunters. Dollars that stop poaching. Dollars that protect wildlife, that provide jobs, that educate communities. These are dollars that enable true conservation, giving wildlife value. Yes, indeed, these images represent the harsh reality the destiny of our wildlife when there's no money to protect it. When it's your chance to vote, will you vote for the wildlife and the people of Africa? People whose very lives are invested in wildlife? Or will you vote for the popular misconceptions spawned by social media that's generated by the city-dwelling people of the first world?